everyone desires security. Don't they? By security, I mean safety. Being protected from danger or harm. Living free of the fears that threaten your life or well-being. Everyone desires security. In fact, it appears that God has hardwired this into us. When a man or a woman is placed in a life-threatening situation, our bodies respond instantly, releasing stress hormones that produce what some have called the fight-or-flight response. What I mean by this is that your heart starts pounding. Your breath quickens. Your muscles tighten as your body instantly prepares to fight for security or to flight for safety. Our hearts are indeed wired to seek security. But I would add to that this morning that everyone also desires to be happy. Am I wrong? I think not. And by happy, I mean a subjective sense of well-being. A satisfaction with the important aspects of your life. Some would describe happiness this way. Experiencing the presence of positive pleasures and yet low levels of negative pains. In fact, this too, like the desire for security, seems to be hardwired into us. You don't believe me? Just observe the behavior of a toddler. They instinctively pursue pleasure and shun pain. Every wise parent harnesses this knowledge for their own benefit and the child's good. Consider how the average child responds to broccoli. I said average. There's always exceptions. Weirdos in the group. Their eyebrows furrow. Their lips tighten. Their hands raise in defense as they anticipate the displeasure. The food ends up on the floor. Now, in contrast, consider same child, the average child, and their response to ice cream, particularly soft serve. Their eyes light up. Their hands, particularly the little ones, I know, I've had a few, begin to open and close. Their body begins to jitter and move with anticipation of pleasure or happiness that the ice cream is about to bring. Now, some might be saying, that's me, and I'm not even a child. Well, if the shoe fits. Our hearts, indeed, are hardwired. For happiness. While all of humanity, in some sense, is united in this hardwiring for security and for happiness, opinions, or we could use a different term, philosophies vary concerning how it is that we lay hold of our desired security and happiness. Take, for instance, the philosophy that's called humanism. Very popular in our day. Humanism seeks security and happiness apart from God. It's part of the definition. Good without God. And through reliance upon human reason. Atheists and agnostics tend to be Humanistic. Now, on the other hand, there's a philosophical category that's called theism. Theism seeks security and happiness through one's God, or in some cases, gods, plural. 
and typically emphasizes the importance of religion in obtaining security, ultimate security, and happiness. Muslims, Mormons, Buddhists would all be classified as philosophical theists. Perhaps you've heard of individualism. This, to some extent, is woven deeply into the fabric of the American spirit. Philosophical individualism seeks security and happiness through self-reliance and personal liberty or autonomy. As I just mentioned, America historically was founded upon philosophical, individualistic thinking. And this stands in stark contrast to the rising popularity of philosophical collectivism. Collectivism seeks security and happiness through interdependence, not personal liberty, and subordination to the social collective. That might be the state. That might be a nation. That, that might be a race or a particular social class. Many Eastern nations, like Japan, China, Korea, have historically embodied these ideals. I want you to continue to ponder with me the various ways that we pursue security and happiness. Consider philosophical materialism. Materialism, very popular in any first world region. Materialism seeks security and happiness through the accumulation of and protection of stuff. Possessions, wealth, material things. Um, the philosophical materialism embodies so much of what Christ spoke to when he said concerning the people in his day, believing life consisted in the abundance of the things that they possessed. That's philosophical materialism. And yet we find even in our day, as the philosophical pendulum swings a rise in philosophical minimalism. Minimalism, in contrast, seeks security and happiness through the purposeful minimalization or rejection of stuff. For this enables one to prioritize one's passions, whether it be a hobby or some type of social activity, travel, outdoors, people that surround you. There's materialism and there's minimalism. One more set for us to consider. Much of our world today can be described through the philosophical ideals of hedonism. Hedonism Seek security and happiness through just, just indulging in your passions. Like you got a craving, satisfy it. You got an itch, scratch it. The highest good to a hedonist is the fulfillment of their personal pleasure. A modern hedonist lives by the mantra, eat, drink, and binge Netflix for tomorrow we die. Or the young hedonist, teenage male, eat, drink, and game through the night. For tomorrow we die. And yet, in contrast to hedonism, there is an ideal of virtuism, historically sometimes referred to as Eudaimonism, this is the conviction that security and happiness are ultimately found not through indulging in your passions, but through pursuing what is noble, what is virtuous, the cultivation 
of character. And we find virtuous that exist in our day. You might even be one to some degree. You, here's what I'm saying this morning. Let's, let's bring it all back front and central. Here's what I'm saying this morning. You are a philosophical mixture of these various isms and more. Time doesn't permit us to explore all the, pos the possible realities. As we're chewing on this, though, I think this will be helpful. If you had to make a philosophical label to describe the average Hoosier baby boomer, what would that label be? All right, now if you're listening as a Hoosier baby boomer, I mean no malice in this description, but I think it's fair. And it's a stereotype. And it may not be describing you, but it might be if the shoe fits where. The average Hoosier baby boomer, like it or not, their description would likely read theistic, individualistic, materialistic, virtuous. Now let me explain that. Theistic, probably identifying themselves as a Christian. Individualistic, bill of rights advocating, limited government preferring. Materialistic, be honest, you like your junk. You're the generation that gave rise to eBay. Own it. Virtuist. In the sense that, that you believe doing what is right is superior to doing what is immediate and what feels nice. I think that's a fair description of the average Hoosier baby boomer. That explains a lot about what they believe is necessary to find security and find personal happiness. Now let's contrast that. Let's dole out equal opportunity punishment to the opposite generation. If I had to create a philosophical label for the average Hoosier millennial, oh my, then what would it look like? I'd suggest to you it would read humanistic, collectivistic, minimalistic, hedonist. Let me unpack that for you. Humanistic, the average millennial, is agnostic. Maybe even atheistic. Sure, there's a God, higher power. Knowing that God, not my concern. Collectivistic. Much warmer to socialistic ideals. The abandonment of personal liberties for the enhancement of the collective whole. Minimalistic, less attached to things. More likely to just junk it. Throw it out. Hedonistic. Believing the highest good is the personal fulfillment of their pleasures in the immediate. Now, as I mentioned earlier, where do you fit? I got no clue. The permutations are endless when it comes to creating philosophical labels to describe individuals. So many variables. Now pay close attention. While each of us values security and happiness, various isms or philosophies, whether we realize it or not, guide our pursuits to obtain the ever-elusive security and the always fleeting happiness that we desire, whether you understand the ism that guides you or not. However, my aim this morning is not to give you a lecture on philosophical outlooks impacting the 21st century American man or woman. No, my aim this morning is to contrast all of these philosophies with the teachings of Jesus. You see, believe it or not, Jesus actually has a lot to say about how you and I 
could really find ultimate security and obtain ultimate happiness. And our desire this morning is to hear His voice and to make ourselves subordinate to it. So here's my message this morning in a nutshell. According to Jesus, ultimate security, ultimate happiness are found in following Him. And this is counterintuitive. And this requires alien faith. All right, now let me repeat that. I know you can see it on the screen, but just let me repeat it. According to Jesus, if we're listening to him well throughout this sermon in chapter 12 and the beginning of 13, he is suggesting to his disciples, rather he is boldly declaring to his disciples that ultimate security and ultimate satisfaction is found in no ism, but in him following him and he details what that looks like and when you learn what it looks like to follow Jesus you realize this is counterintuitive it seems upside down and you realize it requires alien faith by that I mean a faith that is not from within but a faith that is outside of me that must be granted to me Now, the rest of my sermon will seek to explain each part of this proposition, helping you see how I derived this from the text, Luke 12, 32 through 34. So let's begin with the first part of my proposition. Ultimate security and happiness are found in following Jesus. All right? This is what we're going to seek to defend. Ultimate security and happiness are found in following Jesus. So follow along with me as we begin working through you at home. Look at the Bible, then look at me, then look at the Bible, then look at me, slap that disobeying child, then look at me, just kidding, just kidding. Snap at them, rebuke them with the force of your words, then look at me. Let's begin in verse 32. Fear. Not. Now, if you are joining us for the first time, we have been working our way through the Gospel of Luke over the past year. We've recently been listening to Jesus as he's journeying along the wrong road to Jerusalem. It's chapter 9 through 19. And over the past several weeks, we've been digesting one particular teaching of Jesus given to his disciples in the presence of a vast multitude, literally thousands where Jesus has been instructing the crowds and his disciples on the importance of fearing God. All right, you recall this from the past several weeks? Keeping God in that position of ultimate awe and reverence where we look to him and only him for human flourishing. Last week in Luke 12, 22-31, Jesus instructed his disciples to be fearless in their generosity or prioritization of his kingdom. Because God, their loving Father, delighted to supply all their needs. So as we launch into verses 32 through 34, I want you to notice that Jesus is continuing in this vein. Fear not! It's not a suggestion, nor a mere governor's recommendation. This is a sovereign command. Let's continue on. Fear not, little flock. This is a very unique title for Jesus' disciples. It's found nowhere else in the Gospels. In Matthew and John, Jesus will refer to his disciples as sheep or as a flock, but never as little flock. This reminds us of the small number of his devoted disciples. Additionally, in calling them little flock, Jesus is assuming the identity as being their shepherd. Let's keep moving. 
Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So the command not to fear is grounded both in their privileged relationship. Because of Jesus, they've now become the sons and daughters of God. Because of Jesus, they have a relationship where he is now their father. So the command not to fear is grounded in that privileged relationship. And here in this text, more precisely, in his loving affections. Notice it's not, fear not, your father has given you the kingdom. The focus there would be in your father's actions. No, the focus here is your father's affections. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The focus is his heart. That's quite a gift, isn't it? Spoken of in Daniel 7. Kingdom given to the Son of Man. And then later in Daniel 7, that kingdom given to the Son of Man transferred to the saints. Praise God. What a father. What a grounding to live a fearless life. Well, let's continue on. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. He said, what? Now this isn't anything new, folks. Christ has been beating this drum since the story about the rich fool back in verse 16 through 19. Remember how he concluded it? So is anyone who is not, and I quote, rich towards God. Now listen carefully. The rich man's foolishness was rooted in his lack of a fear of God and in his failure to consider that God's blessing upon his life, the bumper crop, provided him a greater opportunity to be a blessing to those, i.e. the poor, that surrounded him. The rich man had no intent to sell his stuff, only to big builder barns. I realize I just said that wrong. To build bigger barns. And he had no idea of generously sharing his blessings with the poor in order to advance God's kingdom. No, his focus was on obtaining security and happiness for himself. He was a philosophical materialist. He was a rugged individualist. He was a practical humanist. He was going to obtain security and happiness for himself through bigger barns and a life of pleasure and ease. He was a functional hedonist. And the pleasure and ease would be what his big barns would provide. Jesus' disciples were not to live this way. Can I say this again? Jesus' disciples were not to live this way. Driven by materialistic greed and covetousness. Nor were Jesus' disciples, many of whom were poor themselves, to be prevented from being generous by the fear of want. The fear that they in their giving, would then encounter a need in their own lives and have no means of providing for that need. Jesus spoke this in verse 21 through 28. We covered that a few sermons ago. Jesus' disciples instead were to prioritize following Jesus in the pursuit of God's kingdom. With their lives and therefore with their stuff. As they did this, according to verse 31, and I quote, all these things, end quote, would be added to them. 
So verse 32 and 33 are really just a recapitulation or an intensification of Jesus' building argument. Now let's deal with an important clarification because I know you've all been fairly nervous. You've been thinking about this over the past week or two. You know where I'm about to go, and you've been wondering, you've been wrestling, does Jesus really expect me to sell everything and give it to the poor? Is preacher going to go there? I hope it doesn't go there. That frightens me. Does Jesus demand here in this text the disciples sell all of their possessions and give them to the poor? I believe the answer to this question is, calm down. No. No. Now let me help you understand why I would say that. Consider the following reasons. Number one, the context is dealing with abundance. Not giving away everything. Think back to the story of the rich pool. He's not a fool because he harvested a bumper crop. No, he's not a fool because he didn't have the capacity to at least temporarily contain it. No, he's a fool because of his greed. He's a fool because of his covetous heart. He's a fool because this man does not fear God. And it's his heart that caused him to make plans to selfishly hoard his blessing. That's what Jesus is striking at. That's what Jesus desires to transform. Now, my second reason, again, is from the context. The context is not condemning wealth, but rather the fear of wealth. Remember, positively, the fear of wealth is the false belief that more stuff will cause you to flourish. And negatively, the fear of wealth is the false belief that your generosity will place you in need with no one or no means to supply. Hear me now. Boy, this is an important bumper in the bowling alley of our theology. Money and possessions are not evil in Scripture. For they will characterize the new heaven and the new earth. It's the love of money that Scripture identifies as being the root of all various types of evil. It's the love of possessions that Jesus Christ condemns. Argument number three. Logic recognizes that if one gave everything away, this would eliminate either any future capacity for generosity and immediately place you in the position of now being one in need. Where someone else would have to be generous towards you. For those reasons, I answer, Jesus is not here calling for us to sell all. But he is calling for us to be radically generous. Fearlessly ambitious for the kingdom. Having addressed that concern, let's continue reading to see where Jesus goes next. Verse 33b, second part. Notice what he says. Provide yourselves... So this is a different perspective. Through your generosity, here's a new motivation. Provide yourselves money bags that do not grow old. All I can picture is DuckTales and Scrooge and his money bags. But that's just my generation thing. But I get it. Money bags that don't grow old that don't inflate, deflate, that don't corrode. Treasures in the heavens that do not fail. No downturn. No, no market sell-off. 
No decision by a foreign country or one's own country that causes your personal wealth to vanish in an instant. None of that happens here. Provide yourself with treasures in the heavens that do not fail where no thief approaches and no moth corrodes or destroys. Jesus here provides an additional motivation for radical generosity. It's from this scripture that Randy Alcorn derived one of his treasure principles, and I quote, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Friend, isn't that just dripping all over this text? You can't take it with you, but you can't send it on ahead. This is not earning salvation. No. This is the concept of the reward for faithful obedience for a lifestyle of trust and dependence, for being a servant focused on his mission when his master returns. This is good. This is helpful. Now, circling back to my proposition, this is why I say, according to Jesus, ultimate security and ultimate happiness is found in following him. Thematically, think back to some of the key words here. Money bags that don't grow old, what is that? It's the combination of happiness and security. Treasure in the heavens that do not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, what is that if not the combination of both happiness and security? Now let's finish out our text. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. As if Jesus' prior motivations weren't enough. The Father's giving us the kingdom. The provision of eternal money bags, lasting, secure treasures. Jesus here adds one more. Depending on how you read this verse, Jesus is saying that either our act of giving leads our heart further to value God's kingdom and its advancement. Similar to how sending one's child to a particular school immediately increases one's care for the well-being of said school and the meeting of its material needs in education. Heart follows treasure. This could be what Jesus is saying, which is really helpful and instructive. But you could also read this in such a way where Jesus is here claiming that our efforts to sacrificially advance his kingdom help assure us of our participation in said kingdom. Oh, an assurance slash security, it's so valued. What he could be saying here is this. Where your treasure is, when you see the evidences that in your heart you are treasuring up, you are investing in the advancement of Christ's kingdom, you are following Christ in reality and practicality, be assured in those evidences that your heart, that your soul, that you will be there, too. Again, this is not earning one's salvation, but this is growing in one's confidence or assurance. Either way, it's powerful and again speaks to this natural hardwiring within us for security and happiness. Now that we've worked through our text, it should be clear to you why I'm arguing ultimate security and happiness is found in following Him. Now pay close attention. All right, wake up. If I could, I would peer through that camera. Wake up, hear this. I did not say ultimate security and happiness is found in giving. I did not say ultimate security and happiness is found in generosity. 
That would be a false statement. The happiness and the security is found in union with Christ. It's found in following Him. It's found in developing His mindset. A mindset of giving of oneself and one's riches sacrificially to advance the Father's kingdom in the hearts of the Father's children. This was the mindset of Jesus, oh friend. I quote from the writings of Paul, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. For this reason, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the man to the glory of God the Father. This is where life is found. This is where it's secured. This is where it's obtained in Christ. We cannot separate the blessings from Christ. Do you now see how the gospel stands in stark contrast to all the isms of this world? What I'm saying is security isn't found in acquiring a bunch of stuff. That's called materialism. Nor is it found in giving all that stuff away. That's called minimalism. Security and happiness is not found in stuff whatsoever. Ultimate security and happiness is found in Christ, in knowing Christ and following Christ, utilizing what we have, our riches, to meet the needs of others in the efforts of advancing the Father's kingdom upon the earth. In other words, loving others because we love God. So, having demonstrated that ultimate security and happiness is found in following him, let's now advance to the second phrase, which is a counterintuitive journey. All right, four-year-olds at home, say that. Counterintuitive. Okay, try, you tried. Thank you. All right. Counterintuitive journey. Intuitive is that which comes natural. Your intuition. Right? One of the most popular words of a two-year-old is mine. Second only to no. All right, what's intuitive? Security and happiness is found in getting, hoarding, securing, guarding. What we're recognizing here is that following Jesus is counter intuitive. What do I mean by this being a counterintuitive journey? I mean it goes against conventional wisdom. All right, listen carefully to this. Conventional wisdom says that we gain by getting. Okay, do you see that over here? Christ stands in contrast, compelling us not to gain by getting, but rather to gain by giving away for his sake. Right? And that last part is so crucial. For his sake. Conventional wisdom over here says happiness is found in self-indulgence. I mean, it's hedonistic. Christ, on the other hand, says do not indulge yourself today. Rather, deny yourself today for everlasting indulgence tomorrow. See, it's not conventional. It's counterintuitive. Conventional wisdom says security is found in a storehouse of stuff. Christ says 
Security is found ultimately in being steadfast to sacrifice for his sake. Conventional wisdom says real life requires funds, right? How many parents have lectured that to your growing adult child? Money doesn't grow on trees. Conventional wisdom, real life requires funds. Christ's wisdom, you want to live, you require, you need faith, not funds. And the faith will result in everlasting funds. Money bags that don't grow old. Conventional wisdom says, you only live once. So eat, drink, and be merry. You got one shot, make it count. Christ's wisdom beseeches us, you really live twice, so make the first life count. By devoting yourself to me. by believing in the superior quality of delayed joy. So following Jesus is counterintuitive. Letting go of security in order to obtain it. Saying goodbye to happiness as your wealth walks away in order to discover it. As I mentioned last week, this is why many a Bible scholar has labeled Christ's kingdom as the upside-down kingdom. So I've argued that according to Jesus, ultimate security and happiness is found in following him, which is counterintuitive. And now I want you to see how following Jesus, as I bring this message to a close, requires alien faith. Right? If you're going to walk away from that couch and you're going to imitate Christ in your everyday living and being, you must have a faith that is not your own. What do I mean by alien faith? I mean a foreign faith, not arising from within, not the byproduct of self actualization but rather coming from without as a means or result of God's grace. Now this portion of my proposition is rooted in theological reflection. But yet I've not departed from thinking through Luke's theological lens. You see, the Gospel of Luke is just his first volume. He has a follow-up hit bestseller called Acts. And the question that I found myself reflecting upon in this passage was this. Where do I find this type of faith? I mean, the friend, the more you give yourself to actually doing this, the more you begin to understand how much faith this requires. Where do I muster up this courage? To really sell more, because I want his kingdom to grow. To really be willing to invest radically, because I believe the next life is the best life, and I want to enjoy it to the fullest. Where do I get that? A Piper podcast? Right? Uh, 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 reformed rap rhyme? Where do I get it? And in theological reflection, I had to say to myself, well, Luke's text doesn't really here answer that explicitly. Jesus simply expects his disciples to follow his instructions. However, if we keep reading, particularly the second volume, Acts, we find our answer. In Acts 2, the Spirit of Christ is poured out upon Christ's disciples an event called Pentecost. Peter, filled with the Spirit, stands in the courts of the temple and he preaches the good news of the kingdom. 
for all to hear. Peter explains that the gift of tongues that they're witnessing is not the byproduct of too many beers, but rather the fulfillment of scriptural prophecy connected to Joel the prophet concerning the gift of God's spirit, which was promised to be poured out upon the covenant community, now revealed to be the disciples of Jesus. And Peter offers the crowd, the very crowd that crucified Jesus, he offers them good news. The promise of the Spirit is for them and their children to as many as the Lord our God will call. Luke records in verse 41 that about 3,000 souls, and we're not sure, is that just men? Is that men and women? Does that include young adults or children? We're not sure. But about 3,000 souls were added to the church that day when the Spirit was poured out. And he finishes out the chapter describing the character of this Spirit-filled church community. Now listen carefully to what he says. Listen carefully. Starting in Acts 2, 44 through 47. And all who believed, the Spirit-filled community, were together. But watch this. They had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, they attended to the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. End quote. Here's the question. Where did they get this faith? This willingness to freely sell and give joyfully. The answer is clear, isn't it, in the context of Acts 2? It didn't come from themselves, from within. It didn't come from their preacher, as if Peter had that type of persuasion or power. No, it was an alien faith. It was a faith imparted to them by the indwelling Spirit of the living God. If you were to ask me how was this gift of the Spirit made possible, I'd answer in my first reply, on one hand, because of the love of the Father. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It was the Father who poured out the Spirit that fell upon the Son at His baptism to empower the Son to complete His work. It was the Father who granted the love gift of the Spirit to the Son and then again to the Son's disciples so that they might fulfill His mission of building the kingdom as they transversed the world. If you were to ask me a second time, how was this gift of the Spirit made available, I'd change my reply. I'd say on the other hand, see, it's not just the love of the Father that made this possible, it's the love of the Son. It's the love of the Son for the Father. This motivated the Son to leave heaven and come to earth in search of true worshipers who would worship the Father in spirit and truth. It was love of the Son for the Father that caused Him to pray in His agony in the garden, not my will, but yours, Father, be done. As He committed Himself to His death on the cross, it was the love of the Son for the Father that caused Him, as the Good Shepherd, to lay down His life and take it up again so that he would not in any way lose one that his father had given to him. If you were to ask me a third time, how was the gift of the Spirit made available? I'd adjust my answer one more time. You see, it's not just the love of the Father for the Son, and it's not just the love of the Son for the Father. I'd answer you in this final reply, it's through the love of the Spirit for both Father and Son. 
It was the love of the Spirit for the Father that caused Him to obediently come and rest upon His Son, empowering His lips, His hands, His feet, His sacrifice. And yet still, it was the love of the Spirit for the Son that caused Him to obediently condescend to coming to dwell within us, the disciples of Jesus, and be willing through this indwelling to empower us to advance the Father's kingdom to the uttermost parts of the earth. How is this gift made possible? It's a two-word answer. Trinitarian love trinitarian love and brother and sister this gift of the spirit can be yours too right remember what peter proclaimed promises for you and your children remember the qualification as many as the lord our god will call It's by means of the indwelling Spirit that we receive the fruit of, I'm quoting from Galatians 5, the fruit of faith. It's a foreign faith. It's an alien faith. It's a heart made new, inclined to trust God and fulfill His commands. This is the work of the Spirit. How dare we, Christian, seek to live this way on our own? We don't have the faith that's required. But the Spirit does. Would you begin to pray this week that the Spirit would grant you faith to bear this fruit? Would you begin to ask God because of his son and by means of his spirit to give you faith to believe that your father has actually already but not yet given you the kingdom? Therefore, you are free of all fear. Would you begin to prayerfully ask the spirit himself to show you opportunities to provide yourself with money bags that don't grow old, treasures that are reserved for you in heaven where markets don't crash and governments don't tax. Amen? Now this will require wisdom. For the very spirit that desires you to be generous to advance the kingdom, also desires for you to provide for your own. Right? He who doesn't provide for his own is worse than an infidel. This very spirit that wants you to be radical in pursuit of advancing the kingdom also commends the notion of leading an inheritance for your children's children. So again, I say this will require wisdom and spirit sensitivity. But I think you'd all agree with me. Every single one of us, hear me now if you're watching, every single one of us could be doing more. Right? Every one of us, blood-bought children of God, could be doing more. So I want you to consider two life-giving scriptures now why would i do this remember the spirit bears a sword it's called the word of god consider the first proverbs 19 17 whoever is generous to the poor lends to who say it with me at home good now now for the few here say it with me who does the one who gives to the poor lend to the lord and look at this promise the Lord will repay him. Nobody outgives God. Amen? Man, let the Spirit cut you with that sword. Now look at this. Mark 10, 29 and 30. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there's nobody, no one, you hear that? No one, not you, not your grandma, not your future grandson. There's no one who has left house, brother, sisters, mother, father, children, or lands 
for my sake and for the gospel. Remember, that's the key. Generosity connected to following Christ. Nobody does that who will not receive. And you take this investment banker, you take this, you take it, smoke it. Here you go. Houses, well, no, hundredfold in this time. Don't get ahead of myself. But then watch this. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. What a helpful sword. In closing out, perhaps out of curiosity, you might be wondering, preacher, what isms describe you? Show us your label. I'd say to you, as one just a little bit too old to be classified as a millennial, I feel at times like I'm all over the map. Wisdom leads me to believe that philosophies like pendulums swing from one extreme to another. I think we're seeing that even in our day. So I guess I'm stuck somewhere in between, a bit of a philosophical mutt. While I'm not quite sure where I am, I know for sure where I want to be. I just want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to live out a deep conviction. I want it to pour through my blood and ooze out my pus. The ultimate security and happiness is found in following him. Recognizing this is counterintuitive, recognizing this is an alien faith, and recognizing that this design provides God with the ultimate glory. Right? Because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God hath before, way in eternity past, ordained that we should walk in them. All glory be to Christ. Let's pray. Father, how do we how do we sign off? Probably it's appropriate first to confess. All of us who began this journey by faith through grace have been prone to try to continue this journey by some other means. And it never works. Just as we're saved by grace through faith, we are sanctified by grace through faith. Both are works of the Spirit. God, I confess that I do not think of your spirit enough. God, I confess on our behalf of the entire church that we are not as dependent upon his indwelling power as we ought be. I confess that I do not look to him enough on a daily basis. I do not hand him his sword appropriately that he might do his work and God this is evil that I would be given such a gift and steward it so poorly God forgive us and then at the same time Lord we all want to say thank you thank you for this gift thank you thank you and we we want to say spirit of God grow in us keep chipping away, keep cutting out these philosophies of man and their deceitful clutches and grant us the freedom to follow Jesus with increasing abandonment, radical generosity as we pursue giving all of ourselves for the advancement of your kingdom and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.